Please be seated. The storm inside of us started for me and Anne this morning. We were late, as usual, getting out of the house. Anne is a nutsy driver, but she hasn't killed us yet. She was navigating around duck boats. Smile, it's okay. Uh, but she got us here safely. And I came into the church realizing that I had forgotten my glasses. And if I couldn't see the gospel, I couldn't see the sermon. And Amy came into the sacristy and saw me stiff. And I told her what was going on. I can't find my glasses. I don't have my glasses. I can't read the script. I can't, I can't, can't. She goes, breathe. And gives me a bottle of oil to smell. And it was all right again. And she came up with a very quick solution to the problem. She would read the gospel. And then she says, just go up there and talk. You can't do that. But anyway, thank you, Amy, for calming me. A ferocious gale whips up into a frenzy and a boat carrying Jesus and his disciples is being shredded down to its skeleton. The effort to keep that boat afloat and stabilized is tremendous, but the storm is winning and the poor souls working those sails and ropes are losing. The waves are like large hands with their fingers gripping the vessel with their inexhaustible energy. The disciples are in a fix and they are not able to do anything but be afraid and fight with all their might and one other member of the company has been taking no notice at all of the frantic scene around him. Jesus is asleep. It's been a long day of preaching, teaching, healing. And now he was hunkered down for a snooze. Figured he'd earned a nap. Like a lot of clergy feel after a Sunday service. The disciples had wriggled through plenty since meeting this man of mysterious gifts. They survived hysterical crowds crushing in on them, trying to get at their Lord and Master. They've escaped angry mobs, the law, and uncertainty about what they would eat or where they would sleep. The fishers among them certainly experienced the wild moods of the sea and lived to talk about it. They were very experienced. But this doozy of a storm seems to have been like no other in their lives. Just as the boat is about to be overwhelmed, they shout to the sleepy Jesus and they let him have it. Well, Mr. Miracle, you can see what's happening around us, right? Right? We're going to keel over any minute. Don't you care? I'm paraphrasing. Well, of course she cares. 
Of course he did. He was going to let anything happen to him. So up comes the hand and he orders the wind and waves to be still. Shut up. Stop it. Be still. Just calm. No more fear. No more threat of death. Jesus is serene, but he admonishes his charges. What are you afraid of? What are you so afraid of? Oh, ye of little faith. All was well again, and the boat glided peacefully toward the shore. Yeah, I bet they slept well that night but not before marveling at this man who could command what man could not. The elements of this natural world belonged to him. Some natural storms of this world, as we know, have wiped out so much real estate and a mass of humanity with them. God's omnipresent power gives the world's natural elements free will too. But there are storms inside of us. There are predicaments, stumbling blocks, misunderstandings, breakups, and 15 months of isolation that has produced high levels of anxiety in many of us. Now, as the world opens up for business, free trade and commerce again, there is the fear of going back to work in a building with people. I'm telling you, I, I know a, a handful of people that are a little nervous about this. And if I wasn't retired, I'd be hysterical. I retired at just the right time, Lord. Thank you. Reentry is going to be hard for a while. Those are some storms that I can think of right off the bat. And I bet you can think of some too. St. Paul has something to say about those storms in us. He writes to the church in Corinth that he and others who witnessed to the world about the saving power of Jesus Christ have endured storm after storm coming from the cruelty of others. And they came out alive every time more determined than ever to tell the world that it can be saved eternally, loved eternally, and be in the company of a loving and forgiving God eternally. And what did they get for it? Jail time, savage beatings, aching hunger, being called phonies and imposters, bums. But even with all that abuse, they still loved and prayed for their persecutors. Not so easy, not so easy. But their hearts were opened to God's loving instruction and care. And they trusted in it. But the only way to get that is to calm the storm in you. They put their lives on the line for this for years. God strengthened them even more. God gave them the increase 
and on they went despite the dangers. That's how Jesus stilled the storm. He believed on his father. I suppose if you're the son of God, it is a little easier to believe that God will save you. He knew God could and would save his little band of friends and others in other boats near them. And they would live to make known God another day. But later on in his life, he too would feel the flicker of fear as he faced his own violent death. He knew exactly what was going to happen and how. Did he feel a little fear in the Garden of Gethsemane? Did he wish for just a second? He didn't have to do this until the storm inside him was calmed by the Holy Spirit, which is his father. And he went on. He was not nervous. He was not troubled in that storm on the sea. He was just tired. St. Paul, with all that he had been through, was not disparaged. He forged ahead even when God told him not to. Yes, there is an account of Paul being warned by God in a dream not to go into a particular region. They wouldn't receive him well. Well, Mr. Paul was having none of it. And he went and once again, he was a brutally beaten, attacked, and came out barely alive, lying in a ditch. And God picked him up. I told you. He learned his lesson. Paul did not know better than God. I know one thing. When there is a storm inside of me, like this morning and many other days, there is no solace, there is no solution, there is no saving grace until that turmoil in me loses its fire. From sheer exhaustion and overthinking, and I give up fighting and trying to fix. Only then, when I stop scratching and scrambling up a storm in my ulcerative stomach, will I open myself to God and say, I can't, you can, and I'm going to let you. At last, the furious churning stops, and I am quite content. I hate to admit this, but I have to learn that lesson over and over and over. When I quit kicking, God kicks in. And I ask you to try it when you are in the throes of troubling circumstances. And as soon as you can, Open up by lifting your trouble to God's hands. Just make that gesture like the Quakers. Oh, I'm having a fit. Something's really terrible. I can't hide. I don't know what to do. Here. And then go like this and bring them down. And you have handed it off to God. And then be patient. Salvation will come, and we will not be people of little faith. We don't want to be people of little faith. That's why we're here. We will be saved from our distress over and over again. Amen.